Money FM 89.3, best of weekends. Fiona Tan, who is an archivist with the Records Management Department at the National Archives of Singapore. Fiona, how much information is available from those straight settlement records that, that came from the uh, seven, uh, 19th century? The straight settlements records are basically a set of records that, as its name suggests, date back to the straight settlements period, so to the 1800s. And they um, are basically the colonial government's uh, records uh, that were used to, to, to govern Singapore uh, as, a, as a colony back then. Um, and I'd like to call it actually the founding collection of the National Archives of Singapore because um, it's transfer from the Colonial Secretary's Library in 1938 to the Archives Department of the Raffles Museum and Library was actually the start of our very own archives. So in fact, I have here the very first listing to this set of records um, sorry, it's just the cover, uh, image of the cover. And you can see the little stamp. I'm not sure whether you can see it here. Oh. Yes, yes, uh, I can see it in the corner. The yes. of the Raffles Museum and Library. So uh, there you go. This is our founding collection of uh, the, the records that form the basis of um, the, the National Archives of Singapore today. Well, that's wonderful. And it's called, I believe, this Archives Unlocked. Is that correct? Yes. And what does yes. that actually mean? How does it benefit our, our listeners and viewers? Sure. So Archives Unlocked is actually a monthly talk series that's organised by the National Archives of Singapore, where we uh, invite our archivists to share about interesting collections, about certain topics of interest. And we've been conducting this since our revamp in uh, April 2019. Um, and uh, it's covered a wide variety of uh, topics uh, across different formats and media. Um, but one of the, the, the very interesting uh, example of one of the, the topics which uh, really strike uh, uh, with, the, uh, with our communities are, is one of uh, the topics that on um, how archival collections can help to improve the well-being of uh, people with dementia, for instance, mm. to sort of relieve the past um, memories by looking at uh, audiovisual clips uh, from the 1960s, listening to oral history interviews of people talking about how they grew up in Singapore. So these sorts of things actually archives, it shows really how the archives has a, has a very wide range of uh, applications and uh, it does sort of benefit a much wider community than we sometimes would like to think so. Fiona, what, what has been surprising to you as you look past back through these archives and, and a, a window into the past of Singapore, at least the colonial past of Singapore, what has been surprising to you to learn? So when I first started working in the archives, I did think that the Straits Settlements records are basically a bunch of you know, government records that were made by the, 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 the British colonial government. And perhaps there, there wouldn't be much about the local people because they, they were more about what kinds of uh, proclamations that they made and things like that. Um, but it really was interesting to see how there were sometimes glimpses of how life was like uh, before 1867, uh, which unfortunately we do not have much records of because uh, uh, the because of literacy, there were not many people who actually left behind written records to let us know what was life like um, uh, before 1867. Um, and so I have here a record, uh, which is a letter basically to announce that a certain proclamation was going to be made. And I know you can't really see the details right here, but not to worry. If you join us for the talk, you'll be able to see it in high resolution. Fiona, uh, we can so, actually see it, Fiona. Can you move it a bit closer okay. to the camera? So, Oh sure. yes. So I've also highlighted the words there. So it says here, "Will be pleased to cause the same to be proclaimed by the beat of gong, and copies thereof uh, to fixed up uh, in the usual places with as little delay as possible." So this sort of hmm. paints a very vivid uh, uh, sort of picture, audio picture in this case, of how announcements were made uh, in 1822 in this particular case, uh, where in order to sort of uh, make sure that everybody reads the new proclamation um, that they had to go around the, the villagers, perhaps with the, the gong, and sort of beating it up and make sure, making sure that copies of this. And uh, earlier in the letter, it says that actually Malay and Chinese translations of these uh, proclamations were actually prepared as well and pinned up in these usual places. Um, so it gives a sense of how sort of news was being uh, 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 propagated back then in, in 1822. And it, it paints a very vivid picture through, through some of these records. So just to clarify, Fiona, this would have been, this proclamation was from the British, the British Empire, and it would have been posted up around, as you say, the kampongs and the villages. How did it work? Yeah, so they, they, they pasted um, copies and translated copies of uh, some of these proclamations uh, that, that would lay out certain rules. I think in this particular case, the letter had to do with Raffles' proclamations. Um, so as we know, he, he sort of ruled out, he sort of, uh, he, he did sort of write several proclamations um, regarding things like setting up of a magistrate's court, set, setting up of uh, appointments of certain local leaders. Um, and 
So the announcements of these would have been printed, uh, I was written, I think, written and pasted in, in uh, certain prominent places. And somebody will go around with the gongs to sort of um, <laughs> alert people to please look at the, the, the notice board now. News is out. <laughs> and was that one, sorry, was that one signed by Raffles? I couldn't quite see. Was that a Raffles proclamation? Uh, no, or, this is not signed his... by Raffles. This is actually uh, proclaimed by uh, William Farker, who was then the right. uh, resident of, course, of Singapore. Yeah. So he was writing to uh, Bonham, who was the uh, assistant to the resident. So he, he sort of like, I, I suppose, the, the secretary of sorts. I was just going to I was just going to ask, I, w- I would imagine that most of these would have been signed by Farquhar, right? Given the, mm. the little amount of time that Raffles actually spent in Singapore. Would that be correct? Yeah, 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 indeed. My mother-in-law has spent more time in Singapore than Raffles did. <laughs> <laughs> and she can go visit his burial site. And she not never too far got from to, her She house. never got to write any proclamations. I mean, that is statistically true. Fiona, are any of those gongs left anywhere that do you know, uh, like in the National Museum? It doesn't describe what type of gong they were using or what was the size of the gong. So yeah. I, I really wanted to bring a mini gong to do it today but for the interview today. But unfortunately, since I couldn't ascertain what type of gong, I decided not to. Well, I tell you, we wouldn't have known the difference. You could bring in something you, you bought from Daiso and we wouldn't know. <laughs> so... <laughs> it's true. Now, this is called this particular episode of Archives Unlocked that you're focusing on is called Highlights of the Straits Settlement Records. Is that is that correct? Um, yes, that's right. And this is something that people can see online. Yeah. Sure. Yes, you can actually tune in on our. Uh, you can head to www.go.gov.sg/nas-dash. 19 NOV November to register for the talk online and um, you can tune in on Zoom uh, to hear Christabel and I uh, talk um, bo- talk about the uh, Straits Settlements records and some of its highlights. So uh, go, go, we dot, go off, I'd like to... Sorry, I was just going to say go.gov.sg slash NAS hyphen 19 NOV. NOV. But to simplify, I'm sure if they went to the National <laughs> Archives of Singapore website, they could find it, right? Yeah. And they could find just yeah, archives unlocked. Yeah, you can do a unlocked. search for archives unlocked and um, straight settlements records. I'm sure you'll find it as well. Yeah. Okay, unlock yeah. for us another archive piece. What do you have there? Okay, so what I have here, happy Deepavali to those of us who are celebrating it. But if not, here we have a petition um, that was from uh, the... Um, Chulia merchants to the colonial government. Uh, so here is actually written in Tamil. You can wow. actually see it. And uh, it's, uh, it's a petition that was uh, uh, given to the British colonial government for them to appoint uh, a hitsman or they are to select their own local community leader. So in this particular case, they were actually petitioning for uh, Narayana Pillay, who uh, I'm sure we are very familiar with uh, reading him in the textbooks and um, in the past uh, bicentennial celebrations. Um, uh, uh, but uh, but as a hitman for the merchants. Uh, but what we do not know is that there were actually other hitmen that were appointed for different cl- uh, different uh, communities. So, for instance, they actually also recommended uh, somebody called Kai Mutula. Unfortunately, we don't really know much about the other personalities, uh, but Kai Mutula was actually recommended by uh, a group of uh, uh, over 60 petitioners. Oh, wow. So, here are all their names. For, so, Kai Mutula was actually uh, sort of selected for the uh, coolies and the boatman community. So, it, it shows... Uh, some of these uh, glimpses of how uh, people try, try to take charge of their lives. Yeah. They try to um, also work within the colonial structures and the power structures to, to sort of reflect their wishes and, and they, they conform to this sort of, uh, I suppose, Western way of writing letters to the, to the government to, to seek their, their, their support for certain appointments. So it's not just a couple of pieces of paper. It's, it's actually real-life tactile examples of Singaporeans trying to take a degree of control, an element of local autonomy, to appoint locals to oversee local businesses and so on. Would that be fair? Yeah, yeah. It's not simply a few pieces of papers. It's 170 volumes of uh, these uh, (laughs) records. And um, they are, uh, I would say they are slightly, perhaps around A3 A3 size, uh, comparatively around A3 size, maybe slightly smaller. Um, and they're all bound in, uh, in uh, this 170 volumes. And they are sort of organized by whether it's like letters to governor or letters from governor. So there, there are certain kinds of categorizations. They are sort of filed relatively chronologically. Um, and uh, each volume, perhaps maybe two to 300 pages. 
And there's, so and, they are. And within that, there are, there are lots of petitions and signings and things like that. So even back then, Singaporeans were already complaining a lot, <laughs> right? which, which is fantastic. It's fantastic. Yeah. I think getting involved, you yes. know, yes. expressing their yeah. views, expressing a political voice. Yes. <laughs> Fiona, is it? It's quite interesting that the that the British were actually seemingly uh, quite. Uh, open to the idea of their subjects here uh, having a voice in how they were running the you know running the affairs here that that doesn't always jive with what i think about the british colonial footprint being in in some of the colonies where they had a very strong hand over what would happen and how is is that do you know is that particular to singapore or was that the way it kind of happened across uh, this part of the world i think um at, at least at the very early beginnings um the east india company uh, had a more commercial bent when they mm. when they came to Singapore, um, and so it it they sort of treated Singapore as a as a as a commercial port. And in order to thrive in a port that already had well established business networks uh, within, uh, I mean Singapore wasn't a wasn't just a fishing village. There were already established uh, entrepreneurs uh, mm. by the local communities, and so the strategy that the British had was to um, sort of gain the buy in from the local community leaders in order to be able to further their commercial uh, their commercial uh what should i say agendas yeah, yeah sure. and just on that point you know you mentioned william farquhar is prominent in in a lot of this work and it just reinforces again doesn't it that historical reappraisal of farquhar's role you know traditionally it was a very simplistic one-man narrative raffles was this omnipresent omnipotent leader of singapore which we now know neither of those things are true and your uh, documents seem to show again farquhar's close working relationship with the communities of Singapore. Would that be fair? Yeah, indeed. indeed. Yeah, I think that that is definitely a fair assessment. In fact, several of the publications um, that were done uh, reappraising Farquhar's role in Singapore, or even Raffles' role in Singapore, I, I think quite a few of them actually did draw on the straight settlements, this, this particular set of straight settlements records, um, because uh, we do, I mean, there, there aren't that many records uh, that look at this pre-1867 period in Singapore's history. So the Straits Settlements record in Singapore is one set. There's another set of India office records that are held with the National Archives of India, mm. uh, which are organized slightly differently, uh, but, I, but I believe to be copies uh, of the, the dispatches that were ultimately sent uh, to the India, uh, comp- uh, India office company. Um, and... Uh, um, there are also other sets of records that help with the British Library as well that, that reflect this particular time period. But basically, uh, scholars who are interested in the British colonial workings of um, that, that uh, pre-1867 period uh, would have to sort of go to these three different uh, um, countries uh, to conduct their research. Do you have any last uh, pieces for us to look at, Fiona, or do, are you finished? I'm afraid that's all I have on my tablet. Oh, but that was if a lot. you are interested, yeah, yeah. do join us for the talk, and Christabel yeah. will be bringing you through a lot more highlights. And just finally, from yeah. me, you know, as an archivist yourself, Fiona, what, what are some of your favorite pieces that, we, that they can see at these exhibitions? What, what ones really stand out for you? Right, right. I mean, as an archivist, I find it very hard to choose. Um, so, so the ones that I, I brought in today are, are some of the highlights, but um, I think what really strikes me about this 170 volume uh, set of records uh, is not so much about the, its individual pieces, mm. but the fact that it has survived through the Japanese occupation. So I'll be talking a little bit about that. It's the history of the how the Straits Settlements records came to be. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about how it became sort of incorporated into the uh, National Archives and Records Centre in 1968 when the Act was officially passed to set up uh, National Archives of Singapore. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, of course, the, the people who have worked very hard to try to preserve these sets of records from 1938 to today uh, in, in, in the archives. Um, and that, I think, the, the fact that we are preserving records that will outlive us all is, is, is why I joined the archives. And, uh, and, and so this set of records, the history of this set of records really speaks to that. Wonderful. Fiona Tan, thank you so much. The the program is called Archives Unlocked. Uh, It's going to be next Thursday, the 19th of November, uh, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. And Fiona, you'll be joined by Christabel Koo, an assistant archivist, to talk about this this 170 volumes of the Straits Settlements records. Uh, Fascinating. We look forward to catching you on that and hope you'll come back and talk to us again on weekend mornings. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.